Hey there, Scott Tipton here from Blast Off Comics. Time for part three of our talk with Tad Stones. This week, we'll look at the beginnings of Darkwing Duck and how Tad found himself working with Mike Mignola on the Hellboy animated films. Check it out. Now, obviously, Darkwing Duck is something that people have an emotional connection to. I think it was a touchstone for a certain era. That that idea was that like where did that uh, you know I have a gone show. It's about a duck. You know. What no, was... that was actually that was a different thing. That was actually God. I don't know how it came up or what kind of meeting. Uh, it would be nice to have a memory of it. But all I know is that Jeffrey Katzenberg asked me to develop a show, much like when Michael said, do a show with gummy bears. They were very big on titles. <laughs> they did Miami Mice. They said, that's cool. And then they said, how can you do it? Miami Vice is all about drugs. And you're make it about cheese. Well, Miami Mice turned into, um, I think it had, it actually, he did a, a, a pilot script of it. Um, I did it with Carl Gears and came up with a villain of Fat Cat. And then that didn't go, and then I pitched you know, with Jim, actually, later on, this kind of a detective team called Kit Colby and the Rescue Rangers, um, and pitched to Michael and Jeffrey, and they liked the idea of the show. They say we don't feel anything for this main character, so you're almost there, but you got to work on it. And I said, is it, maybe it's not be that you're not familiar with him like you are with the standard Disney characters, which was a stupid thing to say, but I was trying. Uh, and they said, no, you pitched us these three characters, we got each one. And because I had pitched one drawing, this was the second season of DuckTales, and they wanted to come up with a few new characters. And I pitched uh, Robo Duck, which was Gizmo Duck. It's pretty much Fenton Crackshell. It's pretty much the design off my drawing. Um, Bubba Duck, which was a caveman duck, and then I pitched an alien duck. None of that really created. It's like Robocop had come, off, come out the summer before, <laughs> caveman, space, okay, you know, Flintstones, Jetsons, whatever. Um, it was just like, oh God, it was, uh, in the idea of just brainstorming, throw something out. And they actually liked that. But they said, we have a feeling of those characters, so it's not. The meeting then went on to um, uh, say, are there other Disney classic characters we should be doing? Because DuckTales was a huge hit. Yeah. Side note, George Lucas once said to us, DuckTales is to syndication television what Star Wars was to movies. That's how big it was. And wow. even most of the executives that are currently at Disney don't really have a gut feeling of how big the Disney afternoon was back hmm. then, so specifically DuckTales. Um, anyway, so in that meeting, we said we went down. Like, okay, Mickey still don't want to do Mickey. We could do Donald. He showed up in a couple of of episodes of Ducktales. Goofy's a possibility, and they began coming up with you know detective ideas and all sorts of places to put Goofy in because he was like an everyman character. And we got to you know down the little. <laughs> we got to Chip and Dale, and Michael said, Ah, put them in that show. And and Jeffrey said, Home run. And that was Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. Um, so that was that side. So I had, you know, experience pitching new shows to them, you know, and doing the end. And they said, uh, so again, well, again, names are important. Metro Mice ended up as Chippendale's Rescue Rangers in you know, this torturous route. Uh, the order was we had an episode of DuckTales called Double the Ducks, and Jeffrey loved that name. He says, do a show about Double the Duck. And I thought, this is before Austin Powers, and I said, it's just a spy parody, it's old, they're not making James Bond films really anymore. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have any heart to it, but fine. And I did a presentation, you know, of the kind of stuff you'd expect in a, in a James Bond spoof. And Jeffrey uh, looked at it and said, this is just a parody. It doesn't have heart. It doesn't have a sense of family. And for that split second, I thought, yes, me and the boss, <laughs> thinking simpatico. Uh, the difference is he then said, do it over. And now, which is exactly what I should have done the first time, is wipe out all that crap. Now what are you going to do? And I you know, focused on this duck, and I started thinking pulp. Hmm. and thinking Green Hornet, The Shadow, and that sort of thing. 
Um, and he became, you know, we started playing with the idea of an ego and, and uh, really got to a full pitch that was accepted. Uh, and it didn't go until we had Goslin because it wasn't just, we don't just want a goofy superhero. It had that heart of, here's what a Batman had to raise a little girl, a little girl who refused to stay home. <laughs> that was basically it. Then we went out and they made little toys named Pins, they started selling the show, and uh, I think it was Cubby Broccoli who owned the rights to the James Bond series yeah. said, there's no such thing as the double O agents, Ian Fleming made that up, and we own that. <laughs> and it was like, oh, <laughs> so we needed a new name for, for Double O Duck, and uh, we had a contest, it was just like, you know, my creativity was gone, evidently. Uh, you know, people just dead eye duck, uh, dead shot duck. Or, you know, there was all sorts of <laughs> things like that. The winner of the contest, and I believe it was a $500 prize, was Alan Burnett, who came up with Darkwing, which was one of those, duh. And I just said, let's put duck with it, because Darkwing sounds dramatic and everything, and duck is the silliness and right. basically the series. Uh, and then Alan got his prize money and soon after went over to Warner Brothers and uh, helped create a little show called The you know, Adventures of Batman with Bruce Timm. You know? <laughs> um, so that was, you know, Darkwing had that weird beginning, but he definitely moved away from the spy stuff. You know, and even though it was like pulp stuff, I was saying, no, it's old old comics, the right. comics, and I didn't go back and open up comics, but I, to say, oh, let's do this story, Except, well, but I always remembered stories, some more recent, others, you know, I didn't, if I remembered something, I purposely didn't want to go back and research it, you know, I wanted to just keep the right. stuff of it, um, and I used to tell my uh, story editors that, um, no, pitch me the comic book cover, hmm. meaning the cover that's a visual because animation is a visual medium. What's the fun we're going to have at that? You know, you're and describing that's what DC we're doing. in the '60s, right? Exactly, <laughs> Julius Schwartz and and Julius and uh, you know, gorillas on the cover. I can't believe we didn't do a gorilla show. On. I don't think we did anyway. But um, yeah, I, you know, the sillier the better. I mean, I remember growing up, and uh, there's a Superman annual where Superman got hit with you know red kryptonite and has a giant a giant head. brain head, which David McCallum <laughs> later did in Outer Limits. They redid the same story with Lois Lane, and I believe even with Jimmy Olsen, same story, big head. Kind Flash of head. also had a big head. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Story. So, um, <laughs> sure enough, we said, hey, it's time for the Darkwing Duck, you know, big head story. I don't think we did the Darkwing, I think we did it to Sarah Bellum, um, a villainess. But uh, people asked about Darkwing's biggest foe was Negaduck. And they're saying, he's yellow, black, and red. What? Are those the opposite colors of purple? So I said, no, they're the colors of the evil flash. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember Professor Zoom. And it's like, Zoom. I could, at that time, I probably couldn't even recall his name. But it was like, no, the evil flash was yellow and black. They were just cool colors together. And that's what, you know, that was based on. You know, later on, um, like we did an episode of Darkwing where Darkwing gets bitten by a radioactive spider and grows, you know, three or four additional arms. And that was, I said, wait, that was, I remember Gil Kane drawing Spider-Man with, you know, multiple arms for a couple issues, which I've since known as like 101. Um, so we came up with, you know, just playing with that, you know, in addition to our various vampire potatoes. And uh, Bushroot was a character who's a vegetable character. And uh, I said, people were just you know, thinking of villain things. I said, no, he's our swamp thing. You can't <laughs> kill him. If you chop him up, he's just going to grow, grow and, and you know, do that. Later on, I, I would have, and we did a, an episode based on Twin Peaks called Twin Beaks. And the body wrapped in plastic was bush roots. It's like, oh, he's dead. And it's like, no, that's just his husk. He's, he's you know, <laughs> regrew somewhere else. <laughs> All that fodder came out of Darkwing it was so much fun to, to play with. Um, and, you know, comics just infused, infused every bit of that. Um, 
you know, and it was the goofiest time in comics. That's what I was, you know, really enjoying. Uh, and it was a great team of guys. I think my two animation highlights to this point, but I'm still in the business, uh, is Darkwing and uh, Hellboy Animated, which was literally, you know, adapting comics. Um, but the comics meeting is, is just so great, you know, I just, it's, it's always grabbed hold of me and sucked me in. The more I learned about it, the more I met with comic creators, certainly Mike Mignola, and seeing how he lays out a page and, and uh, how he tells the stories, it's just like, it's just cool. It's just something no other medium does. Well, I'm sure it's very different adapting a, a feature film <clears throat> to the television medium than taking a comic book and adapting that into a animated film medium. Yeah, well, originally Hellboy was going to be a series for um, Cartoon Network. Hmm. And when, um, after 30 years, Disney said, Wow, look at that door. I wonder what it looks like on the other side. Why don't you, tap, why don't you stand out on the other side and look at it? <laughs> what a way to, hey, I can't get in. My car doesn't work anymore. Uh, anyway, I went on to, to work on a, a lot of varied projects. Um, but one of the things I needed was script samples. And so I went ahead and did, um, I had got, gotten to know Mike as we did an Atlanta spinoff that ultimately uh, was closed down um, on Friday the 13th, as a matter of fact. Um, and we did three episodes, which we tied together to do a direct-to-video. Uh, but it was basically, I had been trying to pitch Hellboy at Disney for a few years, you know, um, which is good it didn't sell, because I'm sure he would have been Heck Boy, and <laughs> people would have been, it's just weird to think of him on Main Street, you know, and people like, you know. Um, <laughs> But uh, I got to know Mike in the, the Atlantis series, and so I asked Mike, I need sample scripts. Do you mind if I pitch you a couple of Hellboy stories to see what they'd be like as half hours? Uh, so we did two half hour scripts, and then Mike, you know, rightly so, had to say, you know, I can't be giving all the time to something that isn't anything but a sample. Uh, but later on, it was going to be a series, and I got to work on it largely because Mike knew me from that. Guillermo del Toro knew me through Mike, um, and the guys who owned, who were in charge of merchandise, um, the agents, you know, was my agent that I got. In fact, that's why I went with him. He said, oh, we represent Elmo. Um, anyway, that was, what we didn't know is um, they couldn't make the deal. That, you know, you had Revolution Studios that was doing the live action films. They had the animation rights. Uh, Film Roman was the animation company who wanted to do it, and we were, we were paying to do it. Uh, Cartoon Network was the network that was supposed to put on the air, but they couldn't come up with a deal that everybody thought was fair because, you know, the guy who owns the rights says, I get a big portion because I own the rights, you can't do it without me. And someone else says, we're taking all the risks, we're producing it. And the network says, we're putting it on the air, that's worth way more than you're saying. Whatever, we didn't know this was going on, but the, it died. Um, meanwhile, Mike and I are all excited, saying, we'll do like five Lobster Johnson episodes, and we'll do, you know, three episodes that really have Abe Sapien at the core, and, you know, because we were going to do 65 episodes right out. Um, so again, we were in blissful ignorance, and we went to San Diego Comic-Con, whatever year it was, um, and I was at Mike's table when we got the word that they're not going ahead. Uh, or maybe I just told my thing. Whatever, I heard it perhaps on the way to Comic-Con, whatever. It was that day. Uh, we're not doing a series. We've decided to do a series of direct-to-videos. And it was that weird thing. I remember Mike saying, I guess that's good news. Yeah, doing a series of movies, that, that could be fun. Um, because they could be much smaller, haunted house kind of things, or more like he was doing in the comics. Uh, and uh, you know, we got on board. Uh, of course, the first movie had this, the first two movies, the ones that were done, and this breakness pace that actually overlapped production. So we didn't really have a time to learn from our mistakes, what worked well and what didn't. Uh, you know, and I was at a brand new studio. I didn't know how to put my foot down. So my second day there, the production manager said, 
oh, we've got to take a week out of your script schedule. What I should have said was, oh, the script schedule based on the premise that we haven't even come up with yet? That schedule? <laughs> um, anyway, race through the first one, which works great as the, it was just a helpful animated uh, sort of storms, which was an excuse to do these little short stories, you know, tied together with connecting uh, material. And then the second one, Hellboy Blood and Iron, drew from Hellboy lore, and was much darker, and you know, a story of vampire. So it was Hellboy in Central Europe. Um, then, while we were doing that, Phil Roman was bought by Stars Media, and um, they were still working out that deal. Meanwhile, I got permission to write a third Hellboy, which we did. And that, we finally had time, we knew what worked and didn't, and that was going to be the Hellboy, crazy Nazis, mad scientists, floating heads in jars, cyber apes, Lobster Johnson, all of it was in there. Um, it, would, it was like so exciting to go to that. And then at the end, uh, Stars made a decision, we don't want to put our money into things, we just want to license things like The Simpsons and produce for other people, you know, work for a higher studio. Uh, so that, which should have been seven years of cool movies, ended. I'm just mm. thankful I really got to, to do that. You know, that was just such a whole different thing because Darkwing Duck, we write for ourselves. You know, we, we had to include kids, but the storytelling things were things that, you know, worked in TV animation, you know, for kids. We had lots of fun with it. Uh, Hellboy, we actually, when you saw a great movie and cameras and things like that, you could actually do it in the Hellboy one. Uh, we did, a, there's a great hot and house sequence in the second one. And I said, look, in TV animation, it's like Scooby-Doo. You know, they say, they talk about the atmosphere, you know. Gosh, Scoob, it's just haunted house, you know, that's it. He said, no, we have to go in and we're like a horror movie. We want to feel the haunted house. You know, we had an image of Abe Sapien standing in the room. He says, no, nothing weird's happened yet. Wait a minute, I'm, and he's in front of this big picture window. Uh, I said, wait a minute, something's happening. And you start seeing his breath, the temperature's going down. Hmm. And then suddenly you reveal in a wide shot that the picture window is now covered with hundreds of bloody handprints all over it, which ties into the kind of haunting that it was. Uh, and it was just cool to come up with that stuff, you know? Really getting, pushing the boundaries of animation that we usually didn't get to do on a small scale, you know? And in features, most features, you know, so much is at stake because the budget's so big. They can't, you know, take a flyer on stuff. They try, you know, Treasure Planet was an attempt to, uh, uh, team at, or Atlantis was an attempt, but with Treasure Planet, it was like it was almost too close to Treasure Island. That people said, "Wait, I've seen this before. It's in space, but I've seen it before." It's like, well, yeah, because so many people have done that original book. Mm. But this was our chance to really stretch, and and what we could have done was fantastic, you know. Come on back next time for the fourth and final part of our talk with Tad Stone, where Tad talks about how comics influenced his long career in animation. And to check out books from the Tad Stones collection, make sure to go to blastoffcomics.com or visit us here in our North Hollywood location. Thanks for watching.